Welcome to the third section of our course, Preparing Data Using Spark SQL. In this section of the course, we will be focusing on Spark SQL module. I have explained in the previous section about data operations, lineage graphs, and other things like lazy evaluation. In this section, we are going to put these skills to use and get hands on with Spark SQL. So I will be covering three segments spread across five videos. In the first segment, we will be covering the basics, learning how to load data and how to explore it. Then, in the two videos belonging to the second section, we will be cleansing our data using a range of techniques that Spark SQL hands us. Finally, we will round off in segment three with two videos on the topic of grouping, joining, and aggregating our datasets. In short, I aim to take you on a journey through the Spark SQL module in a very hands-on manner. Before we get started, though, let's briefly summarize what Spark SQL is. Spark SQL is a Spark module allowing us to query structured data inside Spark programs. The data frame API has a rich libraries of functions, including string manipulation, data arithmetic, and common math operations in addition to simple column references and expressions. And it is more performant compared to the basic RDDs. Spark SQL enables applications to run SQL queries programmatically and return the results as a data frame. Spark SQL natively integrates with Apache Hive, so it can also be used to read data from an existing Hive installation. Spark SQL has a common way in how it handles data access through the Data Source API. This universal API enables you to easily load and store structured data as well as connecting to a variety of data sources in a unified manner, with built-in support for Hive, Afro, JSON, Parquet, ORC, and many more. It also provides industry standard JDBC and ODBC connectivity, allowing business intelligence tools to connect to Spark SQL. And last but not least, I have explained in the previous section about data operations, lineage graphs, and the Catalyst Query Up Optimizer. Spark SQL makes optimum use of the Query Optimizer to have an as performant as possible set of operations. In short, Spark SQL allows you to easily and swiftly query and interact with your data, as well as enabling you to easily load and store data. Essentially, it contains the go-to libraries when it comes to interacting with and exploring your data. We now have multiple chapters ahead of us that specifically zoom in on Spark SQL and data frames. We will focus on this part of Spark's awesome toolbox and get our data ready for future parts of this course. Let's get right to it. Welcome to the video, Loading Data from CSV Files. In this video, I will introduce you to Spark SQL module and we will be getting hands-on with it. I will be showing you how you can load data with Spark and how to handle schemas. I promised no more slide heavy videos, so in this video we will be spending a lot more time getting hands on. Time to get hands on. So let's head over to our JupyterLab environment that we created in one of the earlier modules. We're going to head over to datasets and then ML latest small. And here you can see the various files that belong to the data that we're going to be messing around with. If you haven't done so already, I encourage you to have a look at the README TXT. It has a complete summary about everything about this data set about how exactly it falls, what it is, what it references, and what it actually contains. So this is a sample data set with roughly 100,000 ratings in there across roughly 10,000 movies, which have been collected over the years. And this is a common open data set used for all sorts of data science and data engineering purposes. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to create ourselves a new notebook. We do that by pressing on this button. And it brings us to this screen. Now. What I'm going to show you is how to import data from the ratings CSV file that we just saw. So the first thing we're going to do is initiate the PySpark SQL by importing the Spark session. Which we do with this syntax. So here what I'm doing, I'm initiating a Spark session. On the Spark session, I'm calling the builder method. I'm setting an app name. In this case, I'm calling it my first CSV load and we are getting or creating, which is the standard way of setting up a Spark session. And then I'm going to save that in the variable called Spark. So if I run this, you see that nothing really happens, but that's supposed to be because Spark being lazy, it doesn't actually do nothing. So moving on to the next step, we were going to read the rating CSV file. So what I'm going to have to do is tell Spark to read the file and then we're going to see what happens. To do that, we use this syntax. So I'm telling Spark to do a read operation on a CSV file, which I reference by name, which is ratings.csv. Now running this doesn't actually result in anything. So this is again, an example of Spark being lazy. So you see with the little star mark on the side here that something is running and the return is just a data frame, but it doesn't actually show anything. I'm going to store this data frame element in a variable that I call df, and I'm gonna rerun this. 
And then I'm going to show you how to actually see what data is in here. So we're going to do that by doing this. I'm going to do df.show, which shows me that I have four columns in the data, but they don't look quite right yet. You can see that the first row here in the data actually appears to be the heading, and these are supposed to represent the headers. They are not the way we want it to be. So these should be elevated to headers. What you see with the show method is it shows you by default the top 20 rows. I can manipulate this, so I can say I only want to see five rows. And what I can additionally do is I can set truncate to false. And it actually allows me to, if the data in the cells were bigger, it would actually stop truncating it, but we'll revisit that later. For now, I'm just going to be showing the first five rows. Additionally, what I want to do is I actually want to print the schema and that tells me a little bit about the data that I'm dealing with. So this is what I did here is just loading the rating CSV data without setting any defaults. So there's a bunch of settings we can set, but right now you see that this is not as we desire because we don't want these data to be string. These are definite numericals. So we have to do something about this. If you took the time to read the readme the text, it actually says that we're dealing here with comma separated values, with the files having a single header row. So the same goes for all the files in this data set. If a column contains a comma, it is escaped using a double quote, and the files are encoded as UTF-8. We can ignore the encoding because the default encoding that Spark uses is actually UTF-8. So I'm going to ignore that for now. But what we will do is actually set some settings to clean up the data that we have. So I'm going to leave this part alone, and I'm going to actually change the read CSV call we have here to be more encompassing. So the first thing I do is I'm going to set the path, which we already had. That's just a key value way of calling the same information. And although the comma is the default way of setting a separator, I'm going to call it anyway. I'm setting header to true because we obviously have a header line. I'm setting the quote character to a double quote. Additionally, I'm calling the infer schema. Infer schema allows me to tell Spark to just go and figure out what the schema is by sampling the data. It's not perfect, but when you're still in exploratory phase of data, it is really a nice way to see what kind of data you're dealing with without having to hard type schemas. We'll do more on that in a minute. Let's just actually see what we deal with. So I'm running it, and now the first five rows, they look much better. Now I can actually see the proper header row. So the first line of the data is no longer mangled. It's actually properly taking the header, which is done by the header equals to true setting up here. And you can see now looking at the schema that's printed down here that would actually spark invert the schema of every single column as a numerical. So two integer columns, a double, and another integer column. All right, this is awesome. This is exactly what we wanted. So I'm trying to show here that infer schema is a great way to quickly set the schema for the data that we are using. However, the drawback here is that when you don't explicitly set your schema, you can get side effects. So an example of this is, let's say we have a ratings of CSV file and we want to combine it with a, another file where we actually want to apply the ratings on. So there's user IDs and movie IDs. So right now in the sample data, it looks like these are numericals. But let's say you are dealing with data sets where it's not, the movie IDs might be alphanumeric and they should actually be interpreted as a string. If you are combining a data set where, for example, you have 1, 3, 6, 47, and 50 on the movie IDs, and all of a sudden you get an ABC, so something that is not a numerical character, that means that an infer schema on that data set would actually make that column a string. And because of the way typing works underneath in Spark, you cannot actually join those two things on each other. So we'll cover joins in one of the later videos, but for now I'm just going to show you that although I'm using infer schema here to see the schema and use this, I'm actually going to hard set the schema to what I want it to be. So I'm actually going to copy these values and set the schema so that way I know that I'm safe and I know that I don't have any problems later down in the road. So doing this, we call this type safety, and it's actually an important thing to deal with. So to achieve these, I'm actually going to set a schema. I've removed the infer schema and I changed it to schema. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to set a schema DDL, as it's called. So I just copied the headers here and put them in there. It doesn't actually run like this, so it will actually fail, which is because a DDL consists of actually the names of the columns comma separated and then the type of those columns. So since I want to set them two integers, a double and an integer, I'm going to add that and run it again. And what you see now is that what I set now is the user ID to an integer, the movie ID to an integer, the rating to a double, and a timestamp to an integer. So this is exactly the same thing as what we actually already had with infer schema. But now, no matter how many samples I would take or no, how much my data would change, I know that I will always expect it to be an integer on these two, etc.
So the disadvantage, of course, is if you set hard schemas, is that if the data changes, you're, um, you might lose rows of data that are not being able to be interpreted by the schema. But being type safe is a very important thing, especially when you are dealing with data when going into production. So I would never advise to use an inverse schema type setting on loading data that you are using in a production environment. So for testing purposes, for exploratory purposes, please do, but be careful with it. So use with care. Okay, I think this is enough for the first video. Right now, let me just recap what I've showed you. So again, we've set up my first CSV load Spark app with the call up here. We loaded the rating CSV file by setting a separator. We had a setting a header, setting a quote character and actually implying our schema. And I've showed you how to print the first five lines of this. So you actually see what's in there and the schema of the data. So what have we learned so far? I gave you a small introduction into Spark SQL. You got to load some data. I showed you how to set up a Spark session. This is an important thing to remember. And I introduced you to schemas with Spark, specifically using in for schemas and schema DDL.